Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. Michael Zuber, one rental at a time, back with his Thursday expert, good friend of the channel, Mr. Jonathan Twomley. How are you? I'm doing great, Michael. How are you? I'm doing wonderful, man. This is a topic I've been wanting to hit for about six months or so. Uh, it is something you are uniquely qualified in my expert series to talk about. And again, it is something I have never done. Uh, so I love talking to folks who've done things I've never done. And this is about raising uh, money as a general partner. More specifically, this question's about LPs, right? I have raised private money, but it's always been one investor, one debt. They're the, they're the bank, basically, yeah. never never as an LP. So let's think about all the LPs out there. There's a lot of people looking at being LPs because real estate is sexy again. Uh, it's made a lot of money in the last couple of years. So I think there's a lot of people. There's huge social media people pushing, come be a part of my deal, come be a part of my deal. Uh, but what should we tell LPs, uh, limited partners, thinking about investing in 2022? What's some advice we should give them? Okay, well, so before we get into that, let me, let me first say that being an LP can be a really great opportunity, right? Because, you know, you can get exposed to assets that you couldn't get exposed to otherwise yep. for, for a relatively small amount of money. So maybe the, the, the entry point is $25,000 or mm -hmm. $50,000 to get into a deal, whereas the deal itself is a $20 million deal. And like, there's no way that you can, you can get into that deal. And maybe, and if you, and if you had just fifty thousand dollars that you went to spend on a on an asset yourself, right? You could not get the same quality asset that yep. you that you can as fractional. And yep. of that, you have no responsibilities at all. It's a completely passive investment. So I always just like to characterize it as you know your job is just to write a check mm -hmm. and then wait for the checks to come back to you. There you right? go. I like and, it. You know, now it's your wire transfers, but still same same idea. Same you send idea. Wire, Money shows up in your bank account. That's all you have to do. Right? Okay. So it, it is a great opportunity. However, there are things that you also need to be, you know, be mindful of um, when you're doing these investments because there is still risk involved, right? And a lot of the risk has to do, you kind of have two layers of risk here, right? You've got the risk of the deal itself. Um, I mean, let's actually maybe even three layers. You've got the risk of the deal itself you've got the risk of the structure of the deal and you've got the risk of the operator, right? Mm -hmm. So those are three things that you need to, to look at uh, and evaluate when you're getting into one of these deals. And I, and I think probably the best way to, to get your feet wet in this arena is not to go and, uh, you know, try to, um, you know, go and like interview a bunch of sponsors and try to figure out, you know, which ones are the best. I think you should talk with other other LP investors and see who they've had a good experience with. Yes. Right. And 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 build on not just <clears throat> go initially not just on <clears throat> excuse me the track record or reputation of the sponsor, but the track record that the that that sponsor has had with somebody that you know. Exactly. Like specific deals and, and, and hopefully not just one person because that, that's his too small sample size. But you do want to you do want to find out from people that you know mm -hmm. what their experience has been. And so and, and it shouldn't simply be about, oh yeah, they made me a lot of money. Because that's not the only consideration. You want to know, are they reporting on time? Like are you actually getting financial reports from them, or do you have to call them up and ask them to send you the financial reports, right? Are they communicating when something bad happens on the property, right? Exactly. Like right, right away, you know? So like, for, for instance, for me, I always sent out the financial reports, you know, promptly after, you know, I would get monthly financials from the, uh, you know, from, from the pro property managers. And then I would write up my own analysis based on them, but also based on my conversations with the manager mm -hmm. and send that out. But and I would do that on a monthly or quarterly basis. Hmm. But when, if something bad happened, like we had a fire, I told everybody right away. Oh, okay. Like, so it wasn't waiting till like the end of, oh yeah, by the way, we had a fire three weeks ago. Like guys. Yeah, FYI, we but, lost three units. We have insurance. We're... We have a fire, we are insured. You know, yeah. this is going to be disruptive, but this is not catastrophic. Yeah. And we just want you guys to know. Yeah, and that, then, that, that's a big one for me. Uh, when because I get I get a lot of people asking me about out of state investing right all the time and it's really the same answer 
I need somebody on the ground that's going to tell me bad news immediately. Right. Bad news does bad news very, very rarely gets better with time. Right. Right. So that's a big one. So I'm glad you brought that up. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no. And I think I think that there are a lot of particularly more inexperienced sponsors who are really worried about, uh, you know, what their investors are going to say or their investors might get angry with them or mm-hmm. or, or they might lose clients or something. Right. So they, they don't. They're, they're not forthcoming with the bad news and they don't realize that telling people bad news actually builds your credibility with them. Exactly. Right? So, so they're, they're kind of being, you know, backwards about this whole thing. You have to be forthright with people about that. So, so those are the things you should look for on the sponsor side. So you know, in terms of the sponsor themselves, you want to find out their reputation from people that you know. There's a lot of sponsors out there, right? So it's, you don't have to interview all of them, right? You just need to know a couple sponsors that you like and just invest with those, those people on a repeated basis. But do, don't start with the sponsors, start with, start with the people that you know yeah. who have already invested, right? And yeah. your, your list from, <laughs> don't, don't necessarily build it because like, you know, you heard some guy in a podcast or, yeah. you know, whatever, you heard me on a podcast, right? I mean, that's not, that's not, that's not the way to do it. The way to do it is go talk to your friends who have already invested, find out who they had good experiences with, who they had bad experiences with, and, and start kind of building your list that way. So, so that's sponsor. And you want to look at, you also want to look at, so if you're talking to a sponsor, you want to ask them questions like, you know, have you ever had to make a capital call on one of your, on, on one of your assets? And why? Why did you have to make a capital call? Right? Mm-hmm. It, you know, if, if it turns out it's because like there was just something completely out of left field that nobody could have, nobody reasonably could have anticipated, right? And they had to make a cap, that's, that's one thing, right? But if it's something that they should have, you know, the, the, the asset was undercapitalized, they didn't have enough of a reserve fund in the beginning, or, you know, their underwriting was bad and they just missed all their projections, things like that, where they, you know, some, some, the roof, they had to replace a roof and they didn't know that, like, when they did their due diligence, they didn't yeah. catch the fact that the roof needed to be replaced in, in, in a year, right? Like that sort of thing. That, but so if they had to do capital calls because of that, uh, you know, that's bad. If they had to make a capital call because, you know, the Great Recession hit or because, you know, the major employer in town went belly up or something like that, you know, mm-hmm. that's, that's different. Um, it's beyond their control and not really foreseeable. Um, yeah. Is it fair to say, because again, a lot of people come into this again, as an LP or new investor, I think most of them evaluate the opportunity to deal the wrong direction. And you brought it up. They, for, for me, most people look at the deal first. They probably skip deal structure, which yeah. is a big deal, especially with what I'm seeing lately. And then the operator last. I actually want them to win interview or understand the operator first. And I love your advice about go to your friends to build that list. Yeah. I think it's all about the operator. Oh, it's all I about think, the operator. Okay, yeah. good. We it's agree. all about the operator. I mean, because it, well, look, when the market is hot and everything's going well, everybody's going to make money. You can't really tell one operator from another. Mm-hmm. The issue is going to be when something goes wrong, right? Yeah. And that's when you know, you know, and I'm not saying that like, necessarily just because the operator is good that means that they're going to be able to save the deal right but what it means is like you're going to get somebody who's going to be honest with you mm-hmm. forthright with you you know tell you the facts as they are and, and and that's what you know you want somebody who's trustworthy right and who's going to see it through right yeah you want you want someone like you know one of my favorite stories brian burke is a friend of mine he's a great great real estate guy you know he has a Brian had one of his early properties went just sideways, just completely sideways, mm-hmm. right? He never went to his investors for money. He funded for years, he said, he funded this deal out of his own pocket, wow. right? And at the end of the day, when they finally sold it, his investors made money. He was made whole, but he was like, this is my responsibility. I'm seeing this through. He didn't walk away from it, wow. right? He didn't wash his hands and say, too bad. Like he was like, I'm seeing this through. And mm. I, that always made such an impression on me with just the kind of guy. What was his name again? Sorry. Brian Burke. Right. He runs Praxis Capital. I mean, he's, 
he's gotten big. He is able to, to raise uh, huge funds and stuff now. But Brian, and he's all over Bigger Pockets. And if you go to Bigger Pockets, you'll find Brian. Just a really stand up guy. Like, nice. And, and I, I've, I've done the same thing, not on the same scale that Brian did, but I, you know, I bend over backwards not to make a capital call. And I have to say, I've never made a capital call, but there was one deal where I could have. Mm -hmm. But I was like, look, we've got the money. We're just going to fund this. And it was the same thing. We funded it. We didn't go to our investors. When we sold, you know, we paid ourselves back and the investors made plenty of money and they were very happy at the end of the day, even though they were unhappy as the thing was going by. But we never went and asked them for money. Mm -hmm. So I think that shows a lot. Like, are you willing yeah. to stand behind your deals or not? And you want, so you want to find that out. Like, if, if they've made a capital call, what happened? Or what would they do before they would make a capital call? Right. That's kind of, so they should have the property well capitalized in the first place so they don't have to even dip into their own money. But if they, have, if they blow through that, do they have reserves of their own? Mm -hmm. to dip into before they go to investors, right? So that's, that's something to, to, to ask for. You know, ask them, what was the worst deal you ever did? How did yeah. it, right? That's, I mean, that's the kind of information, like, you know, don't ask, the investors I talk to, like a lot of times, they just want to know like, oh, what, what, is your, what have your returns been? Because they're just for, sort of fantasizing about how much money they're going to make, right? Yeah. They're not thinking about the downside. And they, this is your money, you earned it. <clears throat> it. It took you time and effort to earn this money. So you should be thinking about how likely is it that I'm going to lose this money and don't get all ca caught up in the hype of like, real estate's great, it's great, it's great, nothing can happen, it's safe. Listen, real estate is a lot safer than a lot of other things you could invest in. But in a syndication, as we just said, you're taking on three layers of risk. You've got the, you know, you've got your, your, your deal risk, your structure risk, and your operator risk. And, and also just to put this in perspective, like I think a lot of people also make this mistake if you buy the property yourself, the operator risk is you. Yeah. Like people, people are really bad at evaluating that risk, right? Because everybody thinks that they're above average at everything. I mean, yeah, all, all 80% 80, 80 of the people think they're better than average drivers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I mean, everybody, everybody thinks that they're better than average at everything. Well, you and I both included, right? I mean, oh, of course. So, so, uh, so you're taking on a huge amount of operator risk when you buy it yourself, but you're very likely not to really ask the question, like, am I any good at this? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so that that is an advantage to going with a with a seasoned syndicator that they've done this before. They know what they're doing. They have mm -hmm. systems in place that hired the right people. So there's a lot less opportunity for it to go sideways, but it still could. OK, so let's let's talk about then um, your, your deal risk and we'll talk about the structure risk. Right. Sure. So so the deal risk is probably what everybody is a little more familiar with. Yeah, right? I think people poke at that one pretty easy. Yeah, that's, that's like the easiest thing to understand, especially as a new investor. Like, is the underwriting good or not? And they can't really like evaluate the underwriting. Most LPs don't know anything about underwriting. I think it's a good idea to get some kind of familiar, familiarity with underwriting, or at least mm -hmm. try to look at enough deals and sort of compare them side by side so that you start getting a sense of the expenses, right? And so, you know, how much does it cost to run a unit? Yeah, like that's some, it, sorry to interrupt again, but that's the biggest thing for me that I uncovered comparing deals was I, I can now look at them and say who's being um, more conservative and less conservative, right? I still have not done a deal. I couldn't really do an analysis, but I can say you're aggressive and you're conservative because I compared enough and see their uh, see their expense structures and, and their future um, you know income and expenses. Yeah. I mean, obviously, and this kind of may depend on the size of the property age of the property and stuff, but more or less, like if you're, if you're underwriting, you know, six, $7,000 a year per unit, mm -hmm. they are being a lot more conservative than somebody who's underwriting $3,500 a year for, mm -hmm. right. And listen, I have not seen in large multifamily, anybody able to run at 3,500 bucks a unit for years, mm -hmm. especially if you have, you know, the only time that people can really do that is if, they're managing themselves and they're doing the labor themselves because yeah. the biggest management fees and labor are two of the biggest expense items on a multifamily property, right? The mm -hmm. biggest one being property tax, but you got property tax, management fees, and labor. Those are like your big three. And so if you, if you can eliminate two of those, obviously you can run it a lot cheaper, sure. but your syndicators are generally not in that position. Like the syndicators, some of the really, really high level folks may have brought property management in-house, 
but they're still charging a property management fee, right? For sure. The fee is still there. And maybe they have a little bit of labor savings because they can, they don't need to have as many full-time staff because they got right. flow, like they can do stuff like that. But even there, they're not running those units at 3,500. They're probably mm -hmm. running them still at like 5,500, 6,000 at least in, in this day and age. So mm -hmm. that's one thing to look at. Another thing you want to look at is expense ratio, right? What that is, is what percentage of your rents is going to get spent, or not rents, but what percentage of your income, because there's other, mm -hmm. in multifamily, you often have other sources of income, not just rents, but what percentage of rents uh, are you spending every month, right? And mm -hmm. so that's your expense ratio. So you really want, you know, for a property really to make money, expense ratio needs to be in the kind of like 50 to 55% range. That's pretty standard. Mm -hmm. you get it lower than that, you're really going to have a well-performing asset, but it's very hard to get below that. Yeah. And sometimes I'll see people underwriting, you know, 35%. I was just going to say that number. I've seen some deals in my market at 35%. And I have these apartments. I actually just put out a spreadsheet. I gave 10, I have a building that I've owned for, for 11 years. I put out 10 years and it's never been below 49%. Never. I'm like, and again, but remember I pay property management. So six or 7% of that's, but anyways, I'm cool. like, why are you writing at 35%? How does that make sense? Yeah. And, and you, you can't run it. You things. can't. Right? I mean, the, the only, again, if you, you can only do it if you have like in-house property management and you have no staff and you're just, and they're absorbing the cost of the staff and the management fee. Yeah. Sometimes you can, maybe if you might get lucky one year, but yeah. Oof. Or like if you are doing some massive value add where you're, you're really like oh. out to the top line. Yeah. Maybe. Your bottom line expenses are not increasing because they really don't have any reason to, mm -hmm. right? That can be an issue, but you know, you're still over the long term, you're not staying at that 35%. Yeah. Rate because you, you're going to, as the property ages, you're having more, when you do a turn, the turn is more expensive. Yeah, exactly. Like there's more things you have to replace. It just, you know, it just it just changes. So that's another thing to look out for. And I'd say the but the more the more deals you look at it, just like Michael said, compare them side by side, you can start to get a sense for where the expenses really ought to be. Right. And mm -hmm. another thing uh, to look at is uh, the exit cap rate. Right. Okay. Because now, when you are trying to forecast the value of a property 10 years from now, right? Mm -hmm. This is a very loosey goosey thing. I mean, this is not, there's no real pre precision about this. Uh, but the way that you do it is you're, you're projecting your cash flows over 10 years. And typically, what, how you, you should be underwriting that is with basically some standard underwriting assumptions like 3% rent growth, right? If people have a lot of rent growth. If they're forecasting 4% rent growth over 10 years, red flag, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe if they're saying, okay, we, because the market is crazy right now, we think we're going to get five this year and four next year. And then over the long term, it'll be yeah. three, right? Yeah. That's, that's okay. But if they're saying like, oh, you know, we expect four or 5% rent growth forever, that's a red flag. I, that was, that, that's funny you bring that up. The last deal I had had 5%. I think it was actually 6% year one and 5% for the deck or the next nine years. I'm like, oh, yeah. I mean, are you kidding me? And let me explain to you how, so how this relates to then the cap rate, right? So the way that you, so you're going to have your expense, your rent growth, your expense growth, which should be, you know, usually the standard is underwriting at two or 3%, right? And then, uh, you, you have, and that's going to grow over time, a delta. You should be getting more income over time mm -hmm. on those assumptions. You're, you're, after you deduct your operating expenses, but not your CapEx, you get your net operating income. And the way that you value the property is you apply a cap rate to that net operating income. So you divide that NOI by the cap rate, right? And so if you remember your basic math, as you can imagine, the lower the denominator is, right, the higher the result you're going to get. Absolutely. Right? So if, cap rates, if cap rates are low, you're going to get, you're going to wind up with a higher value, right? So the exit cap rate is very important. You want to make sure that the, so the typical underwriting assumption is that the cap rate is going to 
rise by 10 basis points every year you hold to mm. the age of the property. Right? Okay. So, so if you go in at a five, five cap, you're going to, after five years, you're going to exit at a 5.5 cap. After 10 years, you're going to exit at a six cap. Now, I did not know that. That in reality may not be true, but you're trying to be conservative and underwriting. Right? That's yeah. the whole point. You're not trying to like fantasize about how much money you're going to make. You're trying to be conservative in your underwriting. Right. So now, as you can imagine, as cap rates fluctuate, that exit cap is going to, is going to like, rise and fall also. Right. Mm -hmm. But the, but the lower it is, the better the deal is going to look because you, the payment at the end yeah. is going to be bigger, right? Yeah. And that's going to filter its way through, back through the IRR. But also, you can now imagine if somebody is forecasting 5% rent growth a year, yeah. that's going to wind up with a much, much higher NOI number than if they're forecasting it at three. Because Of course, it kind of compounds, yeah. Oh my, I mean, it's, it's, it's enormous. So they can really make a deal look good, even if with no cash flow in the first couple of years, by having really high rent growth and a really low cap rate at the end. Yeah, middle, it's funny you bring that up because again, that was that one piece of information you just gave us, I had never heard, or if I've heard it, I didn't remember it. Because I don't, frankly, I don't remember a deal that I've looked at in the last month or so where the cap rate wasn't actually the same or yeah. lower on the exit. Yeah, and it, I would never underwrite. No, I mean, well, let's put it this way. I would underwrite a scenario in which the cap rate was lower just to see what would happen. But I would not tell my investors. Right. <clears throat> That's the base scenario. Yeah. <laughs> that is not the base scenario that the cap rate is going to go down. Yeah. That's Even crazy. if you think it's going to go down, it's a dumb thing to say. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. Unrealistic. Because because you're right. You take a cap rate from five to four and you add a big NOI hit. I mean, that's just going to explode the upside. It's going to be massive. All you're doing is setting up your. So basically, that's someone who is like, desperate to get funded yeah and and they're and they don't they're just going to take they're just hoping it's going to turn out that well so they're not disappointed and maybe they don't care because they're going to get a bunch of fees up front oh yeah they don't care most of these guys don't care they're fee up they're fee hungry at this point they're getting paid right yeah. so what do they care how it performs they, and they just think and maybe they bought the kool-aid too they drank the kool-aid too like oh it's going to go up so i don't know i think a lot of these people are today's flippers from from when when i was seeing people suffer in 2010 they're they're addicted to it their cost structures all out of whack to me a lot of the syndicators are like mortgage brokers and let me tell you what i mean by this the mortgage industry right now is suffering because they built this structure for a refi environment like we've never seen before refis have gone down 50 percent year on year we reported it yesterday there are going to be layoffs. There are going to be acquisitions. There are going this. The industry was built when there was a lot of meat on the bone. The meat's gone, and right now there's going to be pain. So I think there's a lot of syndicators that came in. It's been a great two years. Um, the party's almost over. There's only one chair left in the musical chair game, and there's going to be a lot of people that have pain, but they can't stop. Their their employee base says yeah. they have to keep feeding, and then what do they do? They buy deals to feed it, and uh, yeah. I, haven't, I haven't seen a good deal in a while. Yeah, and I, so just on the last point on cap rates, it, it may be, so look, we're in a low cap rate environment. Like I said before in an earlier session, I don't see cap rates really changing much this year. Mm -hmm. but, but I would, I, I, even if you really believe that cap rates are only going to decompress a little bit over five years, I'm not saying this is an unreasonable assumption, but I think it's, it, it defies historical yes. patterns, right? So what you want to ask your sponsor is, well, what does the deal look like? Uh, I mean, you don't even have to ask them. Get out your calculator, yeah. right? Look at the NOI from the, the, the year that they're exiting and divide it rather than by what they're dividing it by, which is probably, you know. A bigger number. Five. Use a bigger number. Yeah. Divide it by 6%. Divide it by 7%. See what the, see what the line is that where you're actually losing money on the sale. Right, yeah. because you could historically these asset, you know, C-class property in southern suburban market traded for an eight cap. Right? Yeah, my market was seven and a half. It's California, so a little bit lower, but still seven and a half. The last C-class building I sold, I sold it early. I sold it in late nineteen. Uh, was it a five? I'm like, get me out. I'm, I'm, Listen, I'm happy. In, in 2014, I was buying C-class property. In South Carolina, in like in big South Carolina markets for eight percent cap rates, right? So, it this is and this is where it was always at. Now you have to believe that the market has permanently shifted 
for it never to go back there. And maybe it never will go back there, but you want to know, even if it does go back there, am I losing my money or not? Right. And then, and then like, and if, if I am going to lose my money, right. How likely do I think this is, is to actually happen? And am I comfortable with that level of risk? Mm -hmm. Right. But you need to be asking those questions. Okay. So that, that's the underwriting uh, issue. So, sort of, you know, yeah. very quickly. Then, then the last thing I know you're running out of time, but the last, okay. the I, last I pushed thing, it. The last uh, thing is the structure. And this yep. is something Mike and I both alluded to earlier. You know, the best structure debt wise is to have, uh, you know, a 10 year fixed, fixed note mortgage, right? That's, yes. the, that's the best. That's the best. Um, because your your debt is fixed and you don't have to worry about refinancing and you can write out whatever's coming. Mm -hmm. But right now that kind of debt is not competitive. And mm -hmm. what's happening is that everybody is getting bridge debt because the bridge the bridge lenders uh, have less stringent underwriting standards, mm -hmm. and um, so they are willing to give more years or or you know full term uh, interest only, which is the same thing as having more leverage. Uh, they are. You know the terms are shorter, so it might be one year, two years, or three years, or two extensions, or whatever. Probably, if you can get two extensions, you're probably okay. But you're not amortizing any of the debt, right? Yeah. So you're not your payment obligation is still high. And if you are forced to refinance after five years and the market is not in a good place, then uh, you know you're going to have to make that capital call on your investors to. To top up the yeah, this this debt structure is the one I think is going to get a lot of people. It's complex. It's a different environment, and I want to tie something back that you said earlier when you talked about the exit. I would tell people to play with the cap rate at the year of the debt expires. So if it's oh, two absolutely. years, do it do it there because I think that's the, I think that's where capital calls come, and that's where people get hurt. Yeah. Is is that first um, that refi? Yeah, that that is the that's a great point. That is a dangerous. Point in the now most people when they're underwriting the deal they're underwriting the debt term and the sale term at the so you're selling when you're instead mm -hmm. of refinancing correct but that that could be when people get caught where they they have to refinance and the market is turned against them yeah if listen so if cap rates go up that means that your property is worth less money and you can get less proceeds and exactly your lender, refinance your lender is going to say okay well I can I can't I'm not giving you yeah 1.5 million which yeah. it would be worth. I'm only giving you 1.2. You've got to go find the other 300,000 or sell the asset. Sell the asset, but you're probably. But if that's the case, you're probably selling it. You're impairing some capital, right? If that's that's the, that. What you've yeah. just went through is what I see in a lot of deals today, right? The 10 year story is great. The 10 year story might even make sense, but the bad debt structure. There's going to be this two year event or that third year event that nobody's planning for, and people are going to get got. Yeah. That is, so that is that is the structure issue that you should and there's another structure issue to to be aware of too which is uh, the use of preferred equity mm. right? yeah so you've talked equity, about that before so yeah. preferred equity is a it's a kind of like debt equity hybrid mm -hmm. where the the so it used to be the case that like at, at the top of the last market when everyone was trying to squeeze every penny out of deals because they were over you know everything was overpriced People were adding a second mortgage to, to commercial deals, right? So you were getting, you know, banks were willing to give you up to 85% in those days. And then people were going to what were called MES lenders, mezzanine lenders, for a second, effectively a second mortgage, mm -hmm. getting up to like 93, 94% leverage, right? Which is great. You can make a lot of money that way. But the problem is if the market turns in the wrong direction, you are screwed, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and now, so what happened was all of the financial institutions said, hell no, we ain't doing that. Again. <laughs> that hurt. <laughs> now, you know, now they actually structured into the debt. Like this is a non-recourse loan, but if you go get a second mortgage, it becomes full recourse against you, right? So mm -hmm. nobody wants to get second mortgages anymore, right? So what happened? This, for a while, nothing happened because nobody needed these second mortgages, but now the prices have gotten so high that, this hybrid has emerged. It's technically equity, but it is, it's called preferred equity, which means that it is above you as the LP in the, in the, the capital stack. Mm -hmm. So you still bear the first dollar of loss, right? You are the cushion for the preferred equity. This is why the preferred equity lenders love this, right? Mm -hmm. Because like they're coming in 
and they know that the people who bear the lo- the first dollar of loss are not them, yep. right? And yep. they are also getting basically a guaranteed payment. So they're, mm-hmm. they're foregoing the upside. However, they're getting like six, seven, eight percent preferred return plus a kicker when they when they get taken out. And the idea is that they are supposed to, um, you know, whenever when all the rosy projections all work out and you've done your value add, and then you do your refinance at a higher value, that's when they get taken out. And now, you know, the LPs are back up in the capital position where they should be, and everybody's fine. And the LPs wind up making more money because, you know, they had this debt, which is now gone. And, and so they're getting more of the upside. So when everything works out well, it's, it's great for in, increasing the LPs returns. However, what you have to understand is this adds risk to your deal, but your deal just got riskier if you've got preferred equity ahead of you in the capital stack. And oftentimes what the provisions of that preferred equity state are if the, if the, the preferred equity, if the, if the terms are breached, they can replace the sponsor, right? So now you may be in a deal being run by somebody other than the person that sold you the deal. And frankly, between you and me, whoever that private equity firm that put the preferred equity there brings in to manage, they don't care about you, Mm-mm. right? Their client is that private equity fund, not you, right? Mm-hmm. So they will screw you if they have to, because you're not their client, right? Exactly. I mean, they, they, they may technically, you know, technically they are, but like, yeah, they're not working for you. Yeah, right? so, <laughs> you're you're a tag along. Yeah, yeah. So you you are the you are like you know you're the infantry, right? Yep. You're, you're the guys who are like, you know, well, we know, you know, they're doing the battle projections and we're like, yeah, we know that 50% of these guys are going to die when we send them over the, when we, when they go over the top, right? You're that, you're that. Yep, right? exactly. So uh, that's, that's sort of my spiel on that. So these are things you just need to be aware of. I hope I didn't scare you off from the mm-hmm. NLP. I still think it is a, it is a, a good vehicle, but you got to know what you're getting into. Yeah. Again, yeah, this is these are why we have conversations with experts because they tell tell you what's going on. They give you a lot to chew on. This will probably be a video that some of you got to watch twice. I will go back and watch this because Jonathan brought stuff that I had not thought about. So, Jonathan, thank you very much. How can people find you? Well, there's lots of ways, but we've already mentioned the group a couple times. So, uh, if you guys want to uh, invest with me, you want to get on my investor list. Just Google Two Bridges, Two Bridges Asset Management LLC. And you'll see the investor form and just fill it out and uh, we'll be in touch. Yeah. If you want to see how it's done, folks, I suggest you do it. If you're a credit investor, do it, get on the list, just see what it puts out. This, this is why I, I am on it. And I like, uh, like reviewing the material. So Jonathan, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Awesome. Mm-hmm.